Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Finance and Corporate Services Committee. Uh, we'll get right into it. There are no consent items, so we'll get into the uh, first discussion item, which is the appeal for the refreshment vehicle at uh, 385 Fairway Road South. We do have a delegation for this item. Uh, Mr. Abed, did you have a presentation, or were you just here to speak in response to any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. No presentation. No presentation? Okay. Um, so questions. Councillor Fernandez. Actually, I don't have any que uh, questions. Well, kind of, but I'd like to move it at the appropriate time. Certainly. To, um, to be approved. Uh, my question is, uh, the, there's a comment in the report that the um, Moxies had made some objections to, to this refreshment vehicle. To be quite honest with you, in the same plaza is, is, is Farmer Boy, which also offers a variety of uh, soups and lunches and things like that. So how is it that we're taking one particular uh, comment as, as the, the one that would be against, when there could be, you know, there's two or maybe even three other ones that are in the area? Pardon me, one second here. Could you click in? Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry, through your chair. Uh, all of them had the opportunity to comment. Moxie's is the only one that had an objection. Okay, okay. I, I just find that ironic, but okay. Um, that's, that's my only question, and I, I'd like to, um, to move that this, be, that this be approved. Okay, certainly. Councillor Gazzola? Yeah, I was going to try to approve it because it was in the... <laughs> it's okay. Certainly. <laughs> no, I, I just... Uh, no, uh, to me, I don't, I don't really see the competition. What Moxie's did, they had the right to do. They, we we uh, circulate, and that's, and that's fine. I think they had the right to object, but I, I don't think it's a valid objection because I think it's a totally different type of business. I see these at Canadian tire stores all around the city, and what they are, people, people that are in a hurry, and, and this gives them a bite... Uh, sausage or something where I think if they weren't there, they wouldn't eat at all. So I think it's, it's better for us to have that kind of opportunity. So I would, I would ask the rest of council to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Yaneski. Yeah, likewise, I, um, I've eaten at Moxie's before, and I, it's a different type of uh, restaurant uh, eating establishment compared to just a, a quick bite with the, uh, the hot dog stand, whatever. And, of course, as Councilor Gazzolo said, Canadian Tire's got a whole bunch of them, and this would be another one typically at a plaza. So uh, I see the, the, the competition issue as uh, frivolous, and I'm prepared to support the application. Okay, there's no one else in the queue. I would, I would concur with the comments that have been made. Uh, Councillor Fernandez did withdraw, so we'll take it as moved by Councillor Gazzola. Those in favor? And that carries unanimously, and we'll move along. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move along to item number two, shaping uh, downtown Kitchener, the 2020 strategic plan. Uh, this will be a 10-minute presentation uh, joint uh, between our staff and Ms. Yatsi. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members of committee. Uh, the City of Kitchener and the Downtown BIA have a long history of working together on a shared uh, agenda to collectively and collaboratively enhance the downtown. Uh, a number of you will remember that back in 2012, uh, this council and the board of the BIA uh, jointly approved a downtown action plan, which ended at the end of 2016. Uh, so, uh, in true collaborative spirit, we thought it was important now to, uh, to bring together another strategy that we can both uh, hopefully jointly approve. So for the past uh, uh, five months, we've been out meeting uh, with, with the public and uh, really asking them two core uh, questions. Uh, and, and keep in mind that another really important reason for us uh, to, to sort of relook at our priorities now is that we are, as a downtown, seeing the most amount of change we've probably ever seen uh, in the history of downtown, and that is going to only uh, grow exponentially as ION gets up and running and we see more development happening. Uh, so we really wanted to, to check in with the community to ask them these two questions. What do you love about downtown today that you don't want to see lost? As we continue to change uh, and grow and 
evolve as a core? What do you truly value that you want to see uh, remain? And then looking forward to 2020, uh, how do we make downtown even better than it is today? So with me today, uh, Ms. Robson is going to walk you through what the community has told us over the last five months. And then Ms. Yitzi, the Executive Director of the Downtown BIA, is going to walk you through the, uh, the draft strategic priorities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Robson. Thanks. So I'll talk a little bit about the work that we've done over the last uh, five months engaging with the community to learn about uh, the questions that Mr. Bloom just outlined. So this slide gives you a little bit of an overview um, of the consultation methods and the numbers in terms of who, how many people were engaged and the number of comments that we went through, 2,500. We input them all into a spreadsheet and analyzed and synthesized them all. So in total, we did five different surveys through Engage Kitchener. Um, targeted at different audiences. We did 10 roundtable discussions that were sector focused. We did a large forum at the museum back in January with about 200 participants. We've held two open houses and two different occasions of information um, booths, one at the market and one at the KPL. So through this data, we identified a few different things, and one of the th things that we started looking at was the areas of focus that our respondents um, preferred. So you'll see on the chart before you, um, five areas of focus ranked. So at the top area of focus, this is meaning kind of what respondents wanted the city to focus on along with the BIA in the coming four years. And so they're fairly closely aligned, but we see at the top end is great shops and restaurants, followed closely by vibrant street life, closely by being well designed and then we also see a diverse and welcoming community and then trailing a little bit even further behind is innovative and we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that manifested in the other data sets. So from looking at all of these comments and the surveys, we identified um, a different f f four different core values and three different themes. And the way that I would describe this is that these core values were ideas that came up over and over and over again in the data. And what it allowed us to do was say, okay, when people are saying, for example, they want more stores, more stores, more restaurants downtown, we understand that in the context of that being local and unique, which is one of the values. So the values that we identified really helped to elucidate the themes and what people were saying that they wanted from downtown. So I'll, to I'll talk a little bit about the themes and then we'll talk a little, or sorry, the values and then we'll talk a little bit about the themes. So here's an example of a quote, and so we would put this into our spreadsheet and try to figure out where it fit and understand what it was saying about someone's experience downtown. So one of our respondents said, Kitchener has a heart and grit that not everywhere does. Or everywhere doesn't, sorry, I said it more grammatically properly than the actual verbatim quote. So the values that we identified are local and unique, and this was something that people talked about wanting more shops and restaurants, but only in the context of offerings that were both local and unique and were specific to Kitchener. They talked about a diverse and inclusive community, and this meant to them that they didn't want a downtown that was just for one type of person, that they wanted a number of different subcultures and cultures to feel accepted in our downtown and included. They want our downtown to be bold and authentic, so some place that feels real, that doesn't feel like it's trying to be something that it's not, and that it's also community-centric. A lot of people talked about their experience of downtown being really hinged on the people that they know both professionally and personally, so a personal relationship with a shopkeeper or a restaurateur, or the friends and neighbors that they run into downtown, and this fabric being really important to how they experience our downtown. So those were the values, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the different themes that we identified. So in our, in our consultation work, the respondents talked a lot about wanting a larger marketplace. So this meant more hours at shops downtown, more diversity in terms of price points and offerings. And there was a big feeling of wanting to do your life in downtown. So people who live downtown were really interested in having the ability to do their daily errands um, within walking distance. And this meant to people things like filled storefronts with interesting street level operations and compelling incentives for consumer loyalty. And so one of the comments that we pulled out for you here is clean up the basics of the DTK environment to set the table so that entrepreneurs can have the drive to go for what they want to do here. And this was we interpreted this as making an uh, environment that is a attractive to business in our downtown. 
So I've got a couple of slides just showing some of the data from our surveys. So you'll see here, um, this chart shows you um, the number of respondents who do these tasks on the left-hand side on a weekly, monthly, occasionally, and never basis. So what I'll draw your attention to is the bottom, where we see 41% of people never pleasure shop downtown. So part of what this is telling us is that there is an opportunity um, to bolster this and that there is hopefully a market, and we think a market, to accept it. In terms of what people would come downtown for, there was a lot of responses around people saying that they would come downtown for more and better shopping. Restaurants and coffee shops also made it to the top of the list there, but you can see that by far and away the number of responses that answered shops and services um, was significantly more. In terms of the act activities downtown that the public prefers, you see festivals, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but this idea about daily services, so people wanting to be able to go to the pharmacy, go to the bakery, drop off their dry cleaning, that type of thing, do their life on foot downtown as a really big desire for how downtown develops in the coming years. Another interesting finding was around preference for independent versus chain retailers. And this was interesting because it's a slightly different result than we've had in the past on this specific question. So you see there's a fairly even break between those who are passionate about independence and those who like a mix of both. And this has shifted significantly in the last four years where there was, in the last time we asked this question, um, a majority that would prefer chain um, establishments. So the next theme that we wanted to describe was something that we've termed heartfelt experiences. And this was about people not wanting to just do one thing downtown, like go to eat or go to see a show or have taken some live music. They wanted to have a holistic experience downtown that was interesting and that they had a sense of discovery and exploration around it. So one of the quotes that we picked to illustrate this was someone who said, we need to provide packages of layered experiences downtown. So people talked about wanting fun, vibrant, pedestrian-friendly streets, using underutilized spaces in unexpected ways, and ideas for kind of doing things that are kind of ephemeral and, and delightful. And so things that folks talked about as ways of achieving this were things like um, shifting our downtown live music to after five to create a more exciting environment in our downtown core um, after the work day and making use of empty and underutilized spaces as, and as well as more festivals. So you can see in terms of the activities that the public prefers to engage in downtown that festivals rated pretty highly as well. And we also gave folks who responded to the surveys options for the types of initiatives they'd like to see downtown. And you'll see here that there is a preference, yes, for pop-up retail, which goes along with our previous theme, but then also King Street into, transformed into a pedestrianized area with outdoor seating. And again, this, the, and this next result speaks to the same thing, looking at using a, a rear lane ways with seating areas and murals, live music programming um, that, you, that for, for folks to enjoy, and roads that are frequently closed to pedestrian traffic. So this really speaks to kind of a social experience in our downtown. The last theme I'll talk about is um, a theme that we've called community connections. And I'll start with the quote on this one because this really gave us a lot to think about. And so in one of the round tables, someone said, taking care of our homeless and our mentally ill would be innovative. Intervening on their behalf instead of intervening to have them removed from our initiatives would be a big step toward creating a truly diverse and welcoming community. So what we saw in a lot of the responses was a recognition of some of the complex social issues that are facing downtown but also a lot of empathy and will to try to figure out how collectively we can address some of these issues. And so people talked a lot about wanting spaces that were welcoming to everyone, wanting to connect with people downtown, wanting to understand how to interact with those who may be vulnerable, and wanting to make sure that we were taking care of everyone in our community. And there was a lot of talk here, too, about the collaboration that happens downtown, whether it's between businesses or whether it's between organizations and social services. 
And this was kind of an interesting um, result for us. So when we asked residents in the survey what they love about downtown Kitchener, people responded that they love Victoria Park and Kitchener's farm, Kitchener Farmer Market, uh, Kitchener Market, sorry. Um, and one of the things that we interpreted from that was specifically around Victoria Park and also in the data that was recently collected for the Kitchener Market, that those are gathering places. And this time of year, you'll notice that with Victoria Park. If you go there in the evening, there's lots of groups of people having a meal, sharing a picnic. It's really a social place. And so we really interpreted this as those kind of community connections and feeling um, part of a community and that belonging. So in total, we ranked the areas of focus based on these results. And so what you'll see, um, and this is kind of slightly more complicated looking than it actually is, what it shows you in um, the bar graph is the number of votes that ranked that priority one. So for example, if we look at great shops and restaurants, um, that had the largest number of number one responses, which is the pink bar. And so it, this sh graph shows those priorities uh, areas of focus that are the highest priority to the lowest. And so we see here that there is this emphasis on great shops and restaurants, followed closely by vibrant street life. And what we thought was interesting in a diverse and welcoming community, you get a real split between those who ranked it first and those who ranked it last. And we found that that split reflected um, along the lines of our respondents who live and work downtown and those who are from outside of downtown. So it was a very big priority for those who live and work downtown and less important for those who are visiting our downtown. So we really interpreted this as we need to be more than diverse and welcoming. We really need to have a downtown that not just feels welcoming but that is um, actively including. And so there is just an overview of those core values and themes again. And I'll pass it over to Linda to talk a little bit about how they, she's used or we collectively has, have used this data to identify priorities for moving forward um, in the next four years. Good morning, Kitchener Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, Going back to priority one, I'd like to speak a little bit about um, some of the initiatives that are ongoing today, um, some of the initiatives that we share with the city as the BIA, some that we do by ourselves and some that the city do independently. Um, in regards to priority number one, we, we believe that we are here to create the runway for businesses to succeed by providing tools to compete in an increasingly disruptive digital marketplace. Examples of possible initiatives would include a retail food startup program, a retail market analysis, physical enhancements that improve the customer experience by wayfinding signage. Together, the city and the BIA share the view that retailers need to be digital savvy in today's retail economy. To ensure they are reaching their target market, we can assist them with training and mentoring through programs offered by the Small Business Centre and others. For example, the Small Business Centre has been exploring the Digital Main Street program, which offers training and support for small businesses wanting to adopt digital tools. The BIA will also be considering a grant program to assist entrepreneurs that want to test the market downtown before they invest in a long-term lease. We are researching the use of our huts that were built for the Chris Kindle market and other locations throughout the core where we can set the table for a learning curve that allows a potential entrepreneur to understand downtown shopping trends. This grant would also be part of a mentoring project where a panel of experts would assist the new entrepreneur with best practices. Taking a comment from the survey, keep working on putting people and businesses together that can benefit from one another's expertise, interests, and passion. And we know we need to focus on this. Also, the Own It magazine is a shared project with the city and the BIA, now a popular publication with anticipation around the launch. We plan to expand the publication's reach in 2018 and to include a retail attraction component. Today, the BIA and the city have worked together to create a map on our shared website that clearly outlines parking in the core. The shape DTK results indicate that parking is not fully understood. We understand this is more of a communication issue that can be addressed through better signage downtown that guides the visitors to the various lots and garages. Okay. 
So now speaking to, oh. Okay. So speaking now to priority number two, foster and support heartfelt ex, uh, urban experiences. So three years ago, the city and the BIA started working together on live music downtown um, over the lunch hour. We increased our investment together as we believe that the music is similar to planting flowers and enhances an experience on the street. So we will be considering shifting this program uh, to some of the time being after five, given the request to offer more activity after work. Uh, the community event sponsorship program was created to assist placemakers, event makers in achieving their goals when conducting events downtown. We learned that these placemakers know their audience and drive foot traffic. The sponsorship has two tiers and allows the applicant to receive up to $10,000 in funding. In 2017, recipients include the Culture and World Music Festival, Taco Fest, KW Community Festival, Night Shift, Summer Lights, and many more. By supporting the founders of these events, we are celebrating our city's diversity, encouraging collaboration between the events and the businesses of downtown. This program has been running for three years and fully supports what came out of the survey that people like a made it in Kitchener experience. The patio program was launched two years ago and was created by the BIA to be a coll collaborative effort with the city. The vision of this program was to build on the city's first investment in the sidewalks downtown. The BIA invested, invested $90,000 over two years to build all the patios that provide fencing and furniture that is sleek, clean, and consistent. The city worked with the BIA on the entire process for the applications, and we continue to work together annually by adding enhancements and more patios. I would refer now to champion a caring and collaborative community. I'm just going to talk about two things, the downtown discovery team and the community builder grant program that's in, under consideration. Um, this priority is actually better articulated as a behavior that guides our other priorities. I refer to the comment received in that survey that Emily referred to that innovation doesn't mean a bunch of people sitting at a patio with their laptops. Taking care of our homeless and our mentally ill would be innovative. It appears that our community wants us to be inclusive of all, um, and so the downtown discovery team was created, and this project started conversation two years ago and just launched this past April in 2017. The discovery team spends time on the downtown streets, forming relationships, supporting businesses, and supporting people of the downtown to get to know each other and share space in a mutually agreeable way. The team creatively problem solves the issues of downtown businesses, navigating the space between the police, the outreach workers, and the people. Our goal is to build relationships which meet business needs while building inclusive and diverse spaces downtown. The BIA will also consider implementing a community builder grant program, and this program is not built today, but would consider assisting groups and organizations that want to be innovative in creating a more inclusive downtown. Possible recipients of this grant would be raising funds that support projects like the Soup Kitchen, the House of Friendship, the Discovery Team, and any other project that supports people on the street. So thank you very much, Kitchener Council, for, for listening to our presentation. So just to, just to uh, wrap up, uh, I just wanted to leave you with one quote that we heard from one of our uh, participants of a round table, uh, who I think, I think this, this quote really speaks uh, and embodies what the strategy is all about, uh, which is people really do feel that anything is possible downtown now, and that really everybody and anyone is here to help them make that happen, whether you're a, a, a business, a community group, a festival organizer, uh, there's somebody here to help you, and this this plan is really uh, set to embrace that uh, that community spirit. So we'll leave uh, I'll leave this up for you to uh, uh, to see, which is uh, the core values and the three strategic priorities. And we look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you kindly for your presentation. Uh, we do have uh, four people in the queue at the moment with questions. So we'll start with Councillor Ionitis. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, <clears throat> Chair Davy. Um, Thanks for the presentation. Um, it's a little bit different 
it's from what we saw at economic development. Um, it seems to, to be a lot, a lot more condensed. And uh, granted, that was a lot of information. Um, but what I what I what I heard from a lot of the store owners and all that, and it was regards to I know this is the topic that you guys are um, wanting to put in there and to be whole, like for inclusive and everything. But what I heard from the the property owners, uh, it was the complete opposite of that. That's what I heard, and I've I've heard that over and over again. What are we going to do with that? And so I know you have it in here, but. I don't. I, it seems like a nice thing to say, but what is what's really going to be done to to help make it all inclusive? Uh, through the chair, I think. I mean, in part. So that third uh, strategic priority, I think, is almost as much of how we do what we do as opposed to what we do. Uh, so one and two, priority one and two, are really about what we're going to do. Uh, I think number three is really about embracing the notion that as we're as we're doing things, whether that's um, you know, from, from a festival all the way up to, to development is, is trying to encourage those that are participating to, or those that are actively making these things happen to do it in a way that's, that's mindful of, of everybody that's downtown and to appreciate that downtown really is a complex network of many different community groups and, uh, uh, and, and not to uh, do things that necessarily impinge on that, but actually make that even stronger and, and better. Uh, so I think, for, so for example, even one way uh, that the city can, can embrace this is when we are doing our festival and events is being mindful of how many community groups can we get to participate into one of our events and not simply be a, the city sort of booking programming, for example, and, and holding a festival, but trying to encourage other community groups uh, to participate and actively participate. So. Uh, it's a, one of those harder ones to quantify, but I think the spirit of it is is to try to get everybody who's active downtown at whatever level to kind of embrace that as a community spirit. Okay, the, that's you answered that very well, and uh, I know it's not an easy topic to to, to talk about, and uh, it's not going to be solvable easy quick. And okay, so my other question is. What I found was very interesting and was because we didn't get the full data, what I found at, at, during the Economic Development Committee, um, I found heritage was really low on what people wanted for downtown. And to me, that was, I found that very intriguing because we hear the opposite here. And to have 2,500 residents say that it wasn't as important, to me, can you explain that differences? Uh, yeah, so through the chair, uh, and I'm not sure whether, we, like, we didn't, we didn't necessarily ask a lot of questions about heritage, so it, it, it parted just because we didn't really focus on that as a specific item. Um, I mean, I think part of the, and perhaps part of the uh, question was really about what you want to see moving forward, and I think people did value, that, you know, they do value the architecture and the charm and the character of downtown. Uh, but I suspect we really didn't give them a, the, the greatest venue to, to say, you know, uh, if given the difference between tearing an old building down or saving it, what's your preference? Uh, yeah, I think generally speaking, people would probably lean towards do what you can uh, to save it. So, so it's hard to say whether we just didn't ask the right questions to get that or whether that was truly a, a response I don't really know. We'd almost have to ask again, I guess, to find that out for sure. But Okay. Okay. Uh, and my last question, and this is dealing with, with festivals and, and live music and the patios, which is, I think has been a huge success and great, great work with that. Um, has there ever been the notion, and I think we've discussed this with others, clo when we close down the streets to have open alcohol throughout the streets? Is there, are we ever, are we ever going to move forward with something like that? I think that would be innovative, and that's what's done in the States. And... It, to me, that will bring more people to the community, to, to downtown, because they they're gonna they feel freer. So I know I'm asking tough questions today, and sorry, <laughs> but um, I'm in that mood. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll take a kick uh, answering that one. So yeah, the, the laws enable it. We've actually we've had groups that have explored it. It's yeah. uh, uh, the quick and easy answer it comes down to is who's willing to take the risk on that and. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that we, as a city, for example, we could, uh, you know, if, if there's an event that makes sense, uh, say next year, uh, you know, we can try to best understand the risk, bring that to council, and to see, you know, is this council willing to to shoulder that risk? And if the answer is no, that's okay too. And then look to the private sector. And if there's a, I think if there's a private sector uh, uh, partner willing to take that risk and to be the first to do it, we would certainly uh, support them in that uh, endeavor. So. 
Uh, I think yeah, you, the spirit of it is yes, everybody wants exactly what you want. It's just a matter of figuring out the details to get it to get it in a, in a way that is uh, safe and and good for the community. Okay, thank you and good work, all of you. It's, it's downtown, so it's it's one of the things that we hear all the time. Yeah. So good work. Mayor Vanovich. Thank you very much, and um, let me begin by uh, thanking you for uh, the great work that uh, that's been done on this. You know, I just even this past weekend, as I was attending uh, many neighborhood days events throughout the city, um, I was hearing lots of positive feedback from people uh, around the city, around uh, the downtown, and, and, and what's happening uh, in in the city. And um, and certainly, I think this is you know looking to take us to uh, to the next step. I think before I go into uh, my question, I just want to I guess start off with uh, Bill's uh, last question and and say I I think you know we really do need to look at um, how we move forward on it. I, I was just in. Um, in New York a few weekends ago and in Hell's Kitchen they had a, a food festival and with you know tons of food vendors kind of like our streetery thing and lo and behold people were walking around with with beer and wine and there had to be 100,000 people on the street and lo and behold there there weren't any issues um, so I think we just need to get our heads around it and and uh, and organize it we know that the province allows it now so uh, it's something that I'd like to see us pursue I guess my question um, comes to um, the st strategic priority of, of business attraction. And um, Linda, you mentioned it briefly in, in your comments, but when I actually look at strategic priorities one, two, and three, and uh, presumably it would fall under number one, um, I don't actually see the words business attraction in there uh, specifically. And I know that um, you know there's a work plan that's going to come in, in, in the fall of, of 2017, um, but you know, I'd actually like to see those words in there. Not, you know, I see retail market analysis, retail food incubator program, uh, I, I, and so what do we need to do to make sure that that's actually included and that we actually start on it this fall? Because um, this is a, a, a huge and, and overdue priority. I think you're probably not surprised to be hearing this from me. Through the chair, um, thank you, Barry, for the question. Uh, when we look at strategic priority number one, um, yes, we we did um, use the word the, the verbiage of creating a runway, a platform. Uh, we use the term setting the table. What we do want to do is we do want to attract business, but we want to ensure that the business that comes down here is able to succeed. That is really, really important. And I had mentioned in my comments that we are in a disruptive state with retail. There's a lot of change to how people are shopping. So I think that to be able to create a really strong attraction program, we need to put together a team of individuals and, and possibly even including commercial real estate agents, um, previous business owners that are put their hand up and that are willing to help us. Um, and put together resources for these people that want to start a business to ensure that they will be successful and that we can put some ticks in the box, um, that they are digital savvy, that they have a smaller space, not a huge space, that their overhead is um, uh, manageable because, again, the trend is that make it in Kitchener experience, that's what people want to see, but they also shop online a lot. So it's just going to be really important to set them up. Um, and that's where I really believe that the attraction part becomes the mentoring part that we're going to help them. I'm not sure if any of you remember, but um, I was not part of the BIA at this point in time, but years ago when Mark Garner was the executive director, there was a full-time position on the BIA team that just did uh, retail attraction. And that was not an overly successful project because it was sort of a, yeah, come on in, take a space. And um, I think they need, I think we're taking a step back and really thinking about how we're going to help them. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on this okay. because I mean, this is language that, you know, quite frankly, we've been hearing the last few years. And, and I think 
now is the point where you know the the the, the comments were around um, you know we need to, the LRT construction to finish and so on. well that's done or you know virtually done now and I think we need to move beyond that and and you know as I attended the sessions and as I talked to downtown property owners and downtown retailers and so on that's the number one thing I'm hearing from them and and so the fact that it's not mentioned in here quite frankly is concerning me and and so we need to move beyond thinking to actually doing it. And so I, I really want to understand how that's going to fit into the strat plan. Thank you, Barry, through the chair. I understand why you're pushing back. Um, just, I know Corey um, has a comment to make. One of the things that I mentioned when I talked about the first priority was starting um, a grant program for startups. Again, I think that's attraction. If a small business owner knows that there's possible funding that might cover, and again, this has to be discussed at the BIA, BIA board level of what the program would look like, um, but if there was possible funding to cover first and last month's rent to get them started, um, I, I actually believe that that is also very attractive. Go ahead, Corey. And I was just going to, I mean, I think if you, if you break down the types of businesses that we could be attracting, I think there's no reason why we couldn't be attracting uh, restaurants and services. I think the real question that uh, the Economic Development Advisory Council raises is, is really around retail and, and traditional retail. And I think their, their advice to us was, uh, you know, is their, I think their question first was, is this the right time to be attracting retail when retail is in such in flux? And, uh, and I think our response to that was, well, our, really our role here is to help make sure that anybody who wants to set up a retail shop can be as successful as uh, possible and we've got the right tools uh, for them. Interestingly, the last uh, three retailers, true retailers, to open up downtown, uh, two that have opened and one that's coming, one is a pop-up. Uh, the other two are uh, service uh, or combination service and retailers. So they offer a service out of their uh, store, but they also sell things. And that seems to be like that may be a new model moving forward. So I think the, the, the first two, I think, are easy ones. The retail one, we still need to make sure we've got the right programs as to, uh, to make sure that they're successful and not uh, here for six months to a year and closing up. Okay, so I guess going back to my original question, which, you know, hasn't sort of specifically been answered, uh, is there a reason why we can't include business attraction as one of the examples in possible initiatives uh, in here? Uh, so through the chair, yes, I think business attraction, yes, we can do business attraction and that can be an initiative. I think the retail is the one where we want to make sure we do our homework and we've got the right programs for, for pure retail. But, yeah, but certainly if we're on a restaurant service and, and other areas where we know there's not as much disruption, I think that's... Uh, a doable initiative. Yeah, and I think, you know, on the retail end, it's really around retail, um, um, retail, uh, experiential retail that, that the direction's going. But my time is uh, up, and uh, Mr. Chair, unless the ward councillor, one of the two ward councillors wants to move this, uh, I'd be pleased to move this. But if Councillor Marsh wants to, uh, I'll leave it to her. We only have one, yes. Uh, Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a, a lot of questions, so I may have to come back in after my five minutes. L let me just start with asking the, um, when you talked about those round table discussions that you had, and, the, and as I'm looking at the community engagement part of the report, you said 10 stakeholder round tables. So who were those stakeholders? Were they businesses mainly? Were they residents mainly? Did you have any people from the suburban areas? Through the chair. The round tables were essentially focus groups and they were sector specific. So they included, there were a number of community builders. So those were generally people who were active in the downtown and the adjacent neighborhoods. There was a round table on uh, retail. There was a round table on commercial real estate. Another one on um, restaurants and food and beverage. Um, and in terms of how those who may not be, have been downtown were engaged, you'll see um, in the report that you have before you on page 2-11, so which gave an um, overview of the consultation, you'll see that 52% um, of the survey respondents, so there were a series of surveys. Oh, sorry, no, I'm looking at the wrong spot. Six, sorry, at the very top you see 62% of the survey respondents live or work downtown, so the, the remaining were not working downtown, so 48%. And this was interesting, and I know that it seems like it's obviously a majority of folks who live and work downtown, but this is actually a fairly 
a, a better split than it has been in the past. So this is a lot more people, 48%, who um, had responded who are not living or working downtown than had been in the past. So what that indicated to us was that there was more interest from those who are not living or working in downtown in the development and the future of downtown. So <clears throat> the research was done by our own staff or by a consulting firm or a research through the chair, all of staff. All of staff, okay. And would you say that it's st statistically significant as, of, as opposed to anecdotal? Through the chair, the numbers are not statistically relevant. The surveys were done through Engage Kitchener. It's not a, it's not a tool that is used in that way. Um, that was part of the reason for using a mixed methodology. So we had the survey responses plus uh, the more qualitative data that came from the round tables and the forum. Okay. So we have the, the overarching, I believe, the whole Make It Kitchener strategy. Why do we have another strategy before us specific to the downtown? Because from my reading of the Make It Kitchener, there was a lot of focus through that, you know, Make It Spark, Make It Urban, I can't remember all of the other ones, but um, it, it seems like we're again putting the lens back on the downtown, not saying that the, I, the issues that downtown have, especially keeping business and the homelessness and, and those kind of things, those are probably very specific to downtown, but I feel like we're putting the lens again back on the downtown. Uh, through the chair, uh, I mean, really, so just to put it in perspective, so Make It Kitchener really is the overarching strategy that this council has embraced for all of uh, moving all of the city forward. Uh, obviously, downtown is a part of that. Uh, this work is really, if you come to sort of the next layer, so those are most of the major initiatives and most of the major investments that council has uh, identified they want to pursue over the next uh, few years. This strategy is really about what we do and what we do with the BIA and what the, how the BIA uh, operates on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. So how do we use our daily uh, resources to, to positively affect change? So uh, hopefully that kind of helps clarify the distinction between sort of make a kitchen or major initiatives and this being more the day-to-day -day on the ground work. Okay. Is it possible to go back to the one slide where it showed um, all the different locations of uh, where people uh, there, um, yes. So, what do they love about? Very interesting to see that um, you know. Show them all the reasons. The ones that are lower on the scale, like the city hall square, is um, very low on on the scale. Is there any understanding as to why that is? Was there any anecdotal comments related to that? Uh, through the chair, no, although, I mean, it's hard to understand how the, how the respondent interprets the question. Does this mean to them just, and I think we actually had sort of asked this question in a way of, if you had to bring somebody from out of town to, uh, that, that wasn't familiar with downtown Kitchener, where would you take them? Right. And, and so, City Hall, Carl's Air Square, if they think of it just as the building and the fountain relative to, say, the marker or uh, Victoria Street or Victoria Park would be different if we said a festival in City Hall at Civic Square. Mm -hmm. They may have answered it uh, slightly differently, so it just depends on how they might have read the question. Okay. My time is up, so I'm going to ring back in. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Marsh. Thank you. So, first of all, I want to mention just a couple of comments in relation to what uh, has been said already. Uh, the, the idea of business attraction really did come up a lot in the discussions that I was a part of, and I, I think it's worth noting that the priorities that have been identified in this strategy are really quite open-ended in the way they've been written. And so as your, the staff team at, uh, our, at the city and the staff team at the BIA draft their uh, business plans, I think that there's, there's definitely room for, for us to look at how can we best approach that, that topic. Uh, also, uh, so as the downtown count, as one of the downtown councillors, uh, and the other one is unfortunately unable to make it to today's meeting, so I can speak on his behalf as well, that we, we both felt that uh, the results of this study strongly resonated with what we are hearing at the BIA table, at the downtown action advisory committee table, and from the constituents that we talk with on a daily basis. I feel that this is a strongly designed 
study that was done, regardless of whether it's statistically uh, accurate or not, uh, we, we can say that a mixed method uh, methodology is really uh, strong at finding ways to, to get at what, what the majority of people want. And so I am very impressed with how the team pulled together all the feedback that was heard from uh, uh, a a very large number of people and distilled it down to the four core values and the three priorities. Mr. Marsh, we're still in questions, okay? Okay, sorry. You're right. I'll come back to my uh, uh, my statements. So, uh, one question is just around, just for clarification, around this idea of open alcohol that has been brought forward. That's a, a was a surprise to me that that came forward today. But I do think that it's worth uh, looking into. But can you clarify? Are we, if we were to look at uh, allowing alcoholic beverages to be consumed? Uh, not just within a very restricted area as we do now. Uh, would that be on a daily basis or would that just be at uh, certain events that have the pre-approval to do so? Uh, through the chair, we would more than likely start with just a festival. Although I'm sure there's some community residents who would love it if it was all day, every day, but I think we would, we would start small. Right. So we don't, we don't want to alert the public that we're going to be uh, just having booze everywhere all the time. Right. Okay, great. And so, uh, so, and do you, uh, can you um, confirm what I was mentioning about the idea that business attraction is still something that we can include in our plans? Uh, through the chair, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was the number one ask of the community, really, through this, and it's not just number one because we ordered it number one, but in terms of all the comments, yeah, they, they want more offerings downtown. And so, so certainly, I think that... And in that tell is business attraction. It's a question of how do we make sure we get there in the right way and we, and we bring restaurants and shops and services that can be successful. Uh, what we don't want is we don't want shops that uh, come here under, you know, with, without the right uh, tools and then they close up, and that's not what we want. We want to make sure that they're here and they're successful. Thank you. So at the appropriate time, Chair, I'd like to uh, move this recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, mo- most of my questions have been answered. I, I have a couple more. I wonder if Ms. Robson, I could ask you, uh, one of the, at the beginning you said more diversity, you want, we want more diversity in terms of price points. What does that mean? Through the chair, there were a lot of comments around kind of a high-end meals versus quick grab-and-go meals shopping that was more high-end, therefore more expensive, and balanced with shopping that was less expensive. So people want more high-end or less? What, what, I don't understand. Through the chair, they want both. Okay. There was another, uh, right around that point, there was a, a chart that you put up that I was surprised because it's, it's opposite to what I thought was the case. It, it dealt with independent Mm. Uh, businesses and and chains, uh, yeah, and I, I was surprised that um, I know the last time they did this, there was almost totally in favor of independence, and no uh, uh, no one really going towards chains, and yet uh, personally, I I I prefer I I like chains. I don't necessarily prefer them, but I like them because. When you're dealing with, you, you know what what you're going to get. I, I'm surprised that you're, there's really actually a, an increase in the number of people that would like change. Is that uh, through the chair? So uh, we asked the similar question. I don't know the exact numbers. We asked a similar question five years ago when we did our last uh, action plan. So in fact, we actually had fewer people who solely wanted independence five years ago, and more people who either wanted chains or. A mix of both. So we've actually seen a shift towards the independence. So it's, it, it's counterintuitive to I think what you're uh, what you're thinking. And a lot of that has really been a trend that we've seen over the last three to four years with, with uh, shop local movements and 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 really uh, a desire for the community wanting more diversity in shopping. And so so we we think we've actually seen a shift closer and more towards the local shopping than, than hmm. the chains downtown uh, at least. So. I guess that's what happens when you get old because that's not the way I remember it. But that's my couple of other questions. Uh, one of the things uh, in traveling in Europe that I really like to see, and it was in in small cities and downtowns, is where the complete downtown had uh, Wi-Fi available for everyone on the streets. Has any consideration been given to that? Has that ever been discussed? Or? 
through the chair, uh, it's been discussed and being discussed. Uh, uh, certainly the city we offer, uh, the service at our facilities, uh, the library, the market, the community center, uh, city hall, Victoria Park, etc. Uh, there is a, a, a private organization that is looking to work with, they've done this in London, work with, so it's not a blanket uh, Wi-Fi, but, if, but they, in London, for example, I think they have 60 businesses that are all signed up under the same provider. Uh, so it, it becomes a continuous uh, service provision of Wi-Fi. Uh, throughout the core, but it's actually offered by the businesses, not sort of a one global provider, but a, essentially achieves the same outcome. Okay, finally. My final question is, deals with parking. Uh, personally, I would love to see the day when there's no parking on King Street, completely left open for pedestrians, if not for the whole day, for a good part of the day. I've seen, I've seen cities that will allow uh, traffic the uh, first few hours in the morning, but the rest of the day and the, all the weekends, completely no parking on, on a stretch, on the complete stretch of King Street. You want to get people out and enjoying themselves. Has any consideration been given to that? Uh, so through the chair, uh, we would agree, and uh, as I think most of the respondents would agree, uh, and we're working towards that. What we know from from North American cities that have tried and failed is you have to build up to that point, and one of the big uh, uh, so if you close the street and there's no activity, people actually find that it feels unsafe and then they actually stay away from it. Uh, so the, the patio program is actually one of the most important tools for us to actually get to the place that you want because once you have a street full with people uh, active on patios, then you can actually close the street and have the experience you want. So I think the, the short answer is yes, we are still uh, very much committed to getting to that uh, point someday. Hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey, and, and thank you for this great report and for coming in today. Uh, I wonder if there's been any uh, consideration given to maybe going out and trying to recruit some businesses that are unique and successful in other areas. And I think it maybe is an example, um, family place toy store in downtown Stratford. Uh, something like that might be great if it's close to the museum. Uh, has that been considered, possibly? Through the chair. Um, absolutely. I have for the past three years probably in all my travels, um, Guelph, Stratford, um, there's shops I love on Carden Street in Guelph, um, always talk to other businesses to say, um, would you consider a, another operation in downtown Kitchener? Um, you can well imagine that um, some of the responses I received we have been in a, you know, we were under construction. It, it wasn't really great here for the past two years. So when I did speak to businesses, they certainly were um, really positive about the change they saw coming in downtown Kitchener. And that's what I see about creating the runway. Um, as we get better, we built the patio program, we make it a much more attractive place. When we go and talk to businesses about considering downtown Kitchener, now that the massive construction is over and the LRT is going to run, I think it would be a much better, um, it would be more well received. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, the other thing I, I love that, that you touched on was, you know, the, the connection between the uh, the store owners and and the customer. And uh, I know, you know, downtown for me, you know, the Bud family was always a, a great connection. Tammy at Rhapsody. Uh, is there a way that we can build uh, those personalities up as uh, you know, kind of ambassadors or, or the stars of our downtown? Through the chair, um, absolutely. Um, that's a great comment. And one of the ideas that I have, and I've spoken to a gentleman we all know, um, Howie Budd, he's very interested, as are other downtown um, shop owners, in being part of that group I talked about that would help that new coming business um, yeah. to tell them um, their stories, uh, what worked, what didn't work, um, to set people up for success. That's what we really want. because. If people continue to fail, attraction won't work because we won't look like a place where there is success. So those people are very, very interested in being part of that program. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my, I had, was looking forward to uh, hearing the uh, entirety of the presentation. My apologies, I had to step out. I uh, just had to do a small interview regarding an item we're discussing later on. 
Um, so it was timely and I couldn't sit to listen to the full presentation. So let me know if the question I'm asking, if it's already been answered and if it has to say it's been discussed and I'll look back on the, uh, you know, the recording and listen to it later. Um, so uh, partly Councillor Gazzola touched on the Wi-Fi. Uh, that's great that we're doing it that way, that we're, we're building that type of a network with uh, individual uh, storefronts that ha would have Wi-Fi. They would still be black spots. Um, is there a way that we could incorporate kind of a blanket Wi-Fi coverage in our core, but there would be a buy-in, so it's subscription-based, so that it could be a cost sharing, and so that the city's not doing it on its own, uh, mm -hmm. and it would be uh, you know, financially uh, feasible um, kind of endeavor on our part as well. Uh, through the chair, so, and I may, and I may uh, uh, look to Mr. Chapman for either affirmation or non-affirmation, but certainly I think we'd be interested in it, and this may be the uh, a digital Kitchener-focused uh, initiative, so I'm just going to lean to him to see whether this is something that's... I, I, I know we've had conversations about this in the past, as a, at least to explore the potential of, of what something that might look like. Okay, Mr. Chapman. Uh, through the Chair, Councillor Singh has touched on one of the priorities that's identified in the digital strategy. We believe that there are assets in the core that are of interest to the telco carriers and that we can leverage those for free public Wi-Fi. Uh, you recently saw an example where the telcos were interested in placing um, the antennas in our facilities. We also know of municipalities where there are public kiosks and other things like that from which you can, can provide free Wi-Fi. Uh, so yes, that's a priority. It's in the work plan. Uh, we've started discussions. Uh, at this point, I have nothing more to report, but it is on the radar, certainly. So more of a comment maybe directly to you as well as you, as you proceed with that works. But, you know, kind of the point that I was touching, it should work in conjunction with our BIA partners uh, so that we, you know, broaden that coverage and even aspect looking at cost sharing as well. Um, the other question I had was related to, and again, if it's answered, let me know, uh, more street closures. Um, I appreciate that during the LRT construction that just wasn't feasible, but now that with close completion, close to it, are we going to be looking at trial projects next year over a longer extended period of time? Uh, I'll give you a simple answer, yes. I think that, would, and in fact, five years ago, what we really heard was that was if people had a want, that was their number one want five years ago, which is close the streets as often as they can and have events like we did on Saturday. Uh, so I think we're always committed to do that. I think there is a little bit of a... Uh, construction fatigue and they're like just give us a little bit of a break but then yes and once construction is clear and we can actually get around the core I think they I, I have no question that the community wants to get back on you know closing the street as often as we as we can now I appreciate that we try to do it in summer months um, or weekends typically it, but the mechanism is there the bollards can come up and down right uh, have you considered doing evenings or weekdays as well so that obviously you're not having to manage traffic as as heavily and then you're bringing the storefronts onto the street with uh, patios, extending those patios out. Through the chair, um, last week we, on Thursday night, we did a, an, an event called the Patio Crawl, and um, that was a vision to something that we can grow on um, that would involve street closure. We did not close the street for the reasons that Corey talked about, just a little fatigue around some of that um, street closure and the patience around that. But the vision would be to do more events like that. We um, did this through the community event sponsorship program. The restaurants were very, very active, and so were the retail shops. And we supported it with um, $10,000, and we put live music all over downtown. And um, buskers, and the, the energy and the activity were fantastic. So I can see the next stage being one where the street's closed, and there's live music, and maybe there's an open license. Good, good. Uh, again, Corey you said it that this is something we've heard from over and over we got to put some serious skin in the game if we if we commit to um, you know listening to what the feedback that we're receiving I'll ask one last quick question uh, the other issue with our core is the um, uh, perceived uh, perception of what the, you know uh, how our core is uh, I think it's 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 a false perception and sometimes negative as well are we working with uh, other agencies regional agencies in in improving that perspective uh, through the chair, so yeah, I mean, I think that is what the, what that strategic priority number three really speaks to is. I think that the community sentiment is exactly what you said: is that it's a false perception, and that in fact, 
people that are here downtown and part of the community, whether you work here or live here uh, or just visit here but feel part of it, uh, you know, they embrace all aspects of downtown. And uh, so, yes, all of the uh, we do meet with, uh, for example, social agencies and community groups regularly. And I think on a go forward basis is, is to continue to, to champion that community spirit that, uh, you know, this is a place for everybody and everybody is equally valued down here. So. Let's say, okay, go ahead. It's just clarity. Are we going to be more aggressive with it or just proceed with what we're doing? Uh, through the chair, I think it's about being more effective. So for, uh, let me give you one example, um, which is, it's not a new initiative. It, it uh, happened in the, in the course of the last few years. Um, when there is somebody who is perhaps uh, struggling with whether it's a mental health issue or an, or an addiction issue and in the moment are perhaps causing a, uh, a problem that somebody else is, uh, ends up calling police. And what was happening previously with those individuals, they would either you know, be shuttled off to, uh, to headquarters or, be, or to the hospital or to a social agency, and not really dealing with their, with their challenges, just simply sort of shifting the problem. And uh, all of the, uh, the downtown social agencies and community groups and police got together and said, we need a better approach, which is we need to take a human-centric approach, which is, it, what does that person really need in the moment? And let's collectively work together as groups to give them the, the supports they need to get them into a better position and not simply, you know, put them in the hospital's uh, uh, lap and say that's, that, that the solution is done. So, so they've called it the connectivity table. It's been operational for about two years or so, but it's really that notion of let's just not move somebody along. Let's actually help them and find the right solution. So I think that's the kind of spirit of, uh, of uh, uh, response we want to see going forward on all accounts. Thank you. Um, just before we go back in uh, for second round for some people, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, good work. I just want to preface it that I, I do like this this document, but my concern is um, my concern is the focus. I realize some of it's going to come out of the recommendations that come out, but when I'm reading through it, this is um, a document that is based in economic development, and what I see. There are a whole bunch of facets. For example, there's the whole conversation that just sort of happened about um, helping people with mental health issues, feeding people that are hungry, which is more important than any of this, unarguably, but it's also not necessarily an economic development responsibility, and it's also not even a lower tier municipality jurisdiction. So my question is, how do you see, in terms of all the important things that are in this document, can we have, I want to hear some assurance in terms of what's going to be coming out of this and how, do you is it do you expect to address everything most everything or is it going to be picking a few targeted areas and going after them uh, through the chair, maybe you wanna, and maybe for a little bit of context, uh, the so the previous action plan, the previous uh, strategic priorities that the, the community articulated and the council and the BIA supported. Uh, just a reminder: so number one was make King Street vibrant. Number two was add residential housing downtown. Uh, number three was uh, build out the innovation district, and then number four was champion a caring, collaborative community, which you can say really is continuing on in, in number three. What I would say about the first three is that uh, we're not taking the, the foot off the gas pedal, for example. Uh, those are still three very important uh, initiatives, you know, vibrancy, housing, and the innovation district. What I think this, this is a, almost like a, not necessarily a new body of work, but an evolution is to say, uh, you know, these are the things that if we do these things right, those three will, those will continue to, uh, to happen. I think one counselor at, a, at one of our advisory committees, I think, said it right when they said, this isn't about hitting home runs necessarily. It's about hitting all of the singles so that when home runs get hit, they become grand slams. So a lot of this is, uh, I think, groundwork for the major economic development activity to continue to flourish and, uh, and happen. Uh, but yes, I think we will be very strategic as part, and why we haven't come to you with a work plan right now is, is to make sure that when we do, we're being very strategic to make sure we're leveraging the best economic output beyond just community output, but also economic output. So it will be about being very uh, targeted and strategic in that manner. Okay, thank you. So the other concern I have, and it's, it stems, again, citizen engagement is tremendously important, but it also worries me when I do see um, a preference towards uh, shops and retail. Uh, I, I read a story the other day about um, the expectation of malls in America from Credit Suisse that they're going to be a decline in retail in malls of 25% in the next five years. Not 10 years, not 25 years, five years. Um, 
Can, can you comment on how the difference between, like, I want to understand, I want to know that staff knows the difference between what residents say they want versus trends. How are you going to address that? Uh, through the chair, so I think this is an excellent question, and you'll notice in some of the, when you respond to the census questionnaire, you're not asked, how many times would you like to exercise <laughs> in the coming week? They ask, in the, this week, how many times did you exercise? Because what you say you might do in the future is different, perhaps, than what you have done in the past, in your past experience. So I think um, the question that you're raising, and people are saying they want to shop downtown, people are saying they want these things, but how does that look in reality if these offerings were to be um, available to them? And we've been doing some research in coordination with this process in the Economic Development Office around some trends on retail. And one of the things, as you've rightly pointed out, is that there's a very high ratio of square footage for retail in North America, and it's resulting in the kinds of things you're describing in terms of malls in America and the decline. So this is part of the conversation around the transition and the um, disruption in the retail sector. So a lot of the programs that we've been looking at to support retail, not just in the downtown, for example, the DISC program that's being run right now out of the Small Business Center is looking at supporting businesses in digital skills. So supporting the online presence of these businesses so that they can run also run a successful storefront operation. So to answer your question, there is a lot more kind of work to be done in determining what are the best ways in which we can achieve the outcome that I think Priority One really talks about, which is we want street level things in our downtown that are interesting and compelling. And there is a question that remains about, as, as Mr. Bloom said, the right strategic initiatives to achieve that. So I think what is clear from the research that we've done, what's clear from the consultation data, and then what is reflected in pr strategic priority one is that there is a desire to have these vacant street, vacant storefronts filled and there we need to figure out kind of what is the best way of doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, second round, Councillor Fernandez. <clears throat> Okay, so you've had a lot of questions around how to bring retail in and what's going to happen, um, you know, with the, the combination of digital sales and, and storefronts. One of the things that I did pick up was um, how are you going to see and, and understand the, su the success of this strategy? Um, you know, it, will you be able to get statistically significant numbers? Besides anecdotal, I mean, anecdotal is very important because, you know, it's people's opinions and, and often people will be very quick to tell you what they like and what they don't like. But you, there's a lot of stuff in here that I think you're challenging yourselves and, and the BIA to do. That's a long question, sorry. Uh, through, the, through the chair, so what we did last time, so when we approved the last plan five years ago, and what we plan to do now is every year, so we will have uh, a, a number of statistics that we will track over the next five years, and I would say, so looking at our last one, half of them were, were, were empirical, so they were numeric, very quantitative, and then we always did a uh, quick annual survey to try to get, uh, again, not statistically significant, but to get about two to 300 respondents, just to basically call it a check-in, and, and that allowed us uh, both doing both of those simultaneously allowed us to maneuver through the five years to see if we're off course, can we bring ourselves back on course, or are we on course and being successful? So uh, we no doubt will do the same uh, as we move forward to 2020 with this plan. So you, my understanding now is we approved this, we're still in 2017, but really this strategy is only a two and a half year strategy. Why only two and a half years? Is it because you expect to be nimble or is there other, other reasons? In the, in the past, um, we did have the BIA shared um, four and five year plans with um, economic development that we worked on together. Uh, when we sat down and looked at this back in 2016, it, we, were, we were under construction. We were going through um, a, a tough time downtown. And we also recognized that um, the retail market was very disruptive um, for a lot of different reasons that have been talked about today. And to create a program that's five years um, just didn't make a lot of sense. We are changing. Um, you can see massive change downtown today. And we wanted to create a program that was focused for the next three years. So it's really 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, 
we feel that if we focus on the next three years in terms of making our downtown stronger and creating a platform for successful business owners, um, perhaps the next time we can create a longer plan, but for this time, uh, shorter seemed better. And, and it, to me, it makes sense. I think that, I think that was logical to, to, to look at it that way because I think you're absolutely right. We've, we've gone through a really huge change. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask about is the wayfinding. So wayfinding is something that is always on the radar for our cycling, advise, cycling and trails advisory committee. Have, when you talk about wayfinding, I'm assuming you're talking about how to find particular restaurants or stores or services. Have you thought about partnering with our transportation department so that wayfinding it connects our cyclists into the downtown core? Because my understanding from studies that have been done is that cyclists spend a lot of money, especially when they come into downtown cores or business uh, hubs. Uh, they want to eat, they want to shop, they, uh, you know, and they want to rest. So <laughs> there's my question. Through the chair, yes. Basically, so there is a there are a number of different kind of avenues or aspects of the wayfinding conversation, and one of them is definitely as you describe. In addition, um, we talked a lot about um, parking, and so we had an interesting. So parking came up a lot, and one of the interesting things we found is that there are a lot of people who don't know that a there is parking, and if they do know that there's parking, they don't know where it is. So there is a, there is a, a desire for more available parking, but then also a lot of people who don't know where the parking is. So just in that one small example, you, you can understand by, by providing better wayfinding on parking, we can start to address that need without actually adding more parking stalls. So I think the point is there's a number of different aspects for wayfinding, whether it's cycling, whether it's parking, whether it's how to find a shop or a restaurant or a specific thing you're looking for, that will all be considered. Yeah, I just don't want to see us duplicating efforts because right. once we make a sign, the sign should be informative on all levels, like pedestrian, cyclists, and, and, and car and vehicle driver, whatever vehicle they're driving. Um, it, it has to be effective and, it, and it's not cost effective if we're doing a sign for store shop uh, finding and then another one to, to direct you to parking and another one and then of course we get into that whole sign signs everywhere signs right um, just quickly I have some comments as well at the appropriate time this discovery team I mean that is such a from, from my heart that, that is such an amazing way of approaching it. It may not be economic development, but have you seen already some changes happening as you deal with these challenges and you partner with business owners and our residents who have um, mental health issues? Through the chair, um, absolutely, we've seen some really positive outcomes. Um, we started thinking about this two years ago. Um, I did approach the working center, and it did take a long time to put this together. This was put together because of the observation that we saw with um, uh, too many situations where we were calling 911. Um, there was a gap in understanding from the business owners of how to deal with what was happening with the vagrancy. Um, there was some uh, misunderstandings around the people that work downtown. Um, and I think that this uh, program in its pilot, which will be reviewed by the BIA board um, once in the summer and again in September, um, I hope it will be continued. It's already proven successful. I'll give you a very quick example of a situation where an individual was um, hurt, uh, somebody who was um, not okay, um, suffering from mental health health and addiction. Um, the police were not able to uh, cooperate with this person. Um, he was agitated and the discovery team uh, came in and within with under, under five minutes were able to calm the person down and um, resolve the situation uh, through an outreach worker. So um, I think the program has great potential and I hope that it can grow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. There are no further questions, uh, comments? Councillor Anetis. Sorry, before you begin, um, we are running a little bit behind time. If you could please keep your comments to about two minutes, I'd appreciate yeah, it. Go ahead. I will, I will, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to thank the team and everything else that they've been doing. I know they've been working really, really hard, and the results are there, and uh, it's coming. Um, 
again, it's been a long road to get to where we are, and I think it's a testament to the staff's team, the BIA, and their dedication to improving it. And I, 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 I don't think we're completely there yet, but we're getting there. And uh, and it's been, a, and I guess we, what we need is more feet on the street, and that's something that you guys can't do yet. So I think all that will come in time. Um, but I also just wanted to clarify my, my comments about the alcohol. I didn't mean it every day. It was just more for special events. Um, I don't think the province would let us do it every day anyways. Um, but and, ha and the reason why I make those comments is because whenever I go to other innovative cities like Nashville and, and then even New Orleans, wherever, you see that mix of people being together and, and if it's done right, and I'm, I mean I want it to be done right. I don't want it to be like out of control and, and everything else. It, it, it makes people want to come in and, and it, it makes the whole downtown as one place and not just each individual place. So I think, I think that's clarifying my comments on that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. <clears throat> so I think it's really critical that the BIA has worked with our staff because we're looking at, you know, uh, staff often look at things at a, at a different kind of perspective than business owners. Business owners need the profits, they need the people coming into their business. And if, if what we're doing from a city perspective is not helping the BIA, then we're just counterproductive. So I, I'm really pleased to see that that was the partnership that happened here. Um, I think it it's, continues to be important that we balance not only the needs of the residents who are living downtown and the people who are working downtown, but the needs of the people from the suburbs. Um, I come downtown because I work here, but I also come downtown because there are some great restaurants here. And I continue to advocate for that because I think that's really important. You know, my daughter came from New York City in Toronto. She is really impressed with what we're see, what she's seeing here. Um, I know the shopping is going to be a challenge for us, and I think we're, we'll, we'll get there, we'll, however the balanced approach is. I do want to say that um, although it says in the financial implications that it's going to be funded through existing economic development operating budgets and reserve, I don't want to see us taking starting another EDIF fund. I think we have to let the groundwork that's been done, the ION that is, that is going to be here and running, I, that we let that play out. Let's see how that changes our downtown and how we see people coming into the core. Um, I'm very uh, touched by the approach about the discovery team. I think that that is, is critical and I've seen that in Holland where uh, I come from, how people are dealt with in a, in a, who have mental illness and homelessness. And kudos to you guys for the BIA to take a, that kind of approach. Um, it helps the business owner not be so frustrated. It helps the resident who's walking down the street to see that we're treating people with respect. And that compassion very likely could bring that person back to the downtown core. Our festivals are bringing people back. I think there are other ways, and I, and I wish you much success on this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Unescu. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate more than two minutes because I didn't ask any questions in the first round, so I could have my comments. Uh, I have five people in the queue. If you could be as brief as possible, I would appreciate it. I have concern in terms of where we're going here, uh, in terms of not the approach that you're taking, and I know you need to try to address these issues, and I appreciate that, but I think the challenge is uh, basically the planning of the city as a whole. And, um, and it's from a land use perspective. When I came here back almost 45 years ago, the downtown was vibrant. It was a great place to work, great place to shop. Uh, activities were happening, there's theaters here, and uh, I liked, I loved it, it was, it was awesome. But I see as we've evolved over the last 30, 40, 50 years with suburban development, We've got big box facilities. We've got the Boardwalk, Sunrise, Sports World uh, Center, Fairway Road. And they're filled with stores, retail stores, businesses. And that's where everybody shops. Convenient, accessible, free parking, no vagrants. It's wonderful. But you can't do that downtown. I used to be able to do and buy my, my clothing here in different stores, from Bud's to Summer's to a few other places. 
back even in the, in the 80s. We had three grocery stores downtown. Three. We have nothing now. We had Zares at uh, Market Square. We had Dutch Boy here before City Hall. This City Hall was built. Uh, Gaudi's provided, provided grocery shopping as well to, to a degree. And now they're all gone. And everybody's begging, according to your stats, we need grocery stores down here. I'm not disagreeing, but grocery stores aren't going to come. These retail stores, too, that are on all these uh, facilities, whether it's the Boardwalk, Sunrise, other uh, locations, they've all left here. And where are they? At the malls. And now you've got those malls now struggling, as, as pointed out. Some of them are now closing down. Businesses are closing down some of the retails because they just can't compete. And online shopping has sort of become a, a strong trend. I'm not into it, but I guess uh, certain uh, uh, age groups are, and certain types of uh, you know, people from the society are into that. And it's become a real competition basis. So where you're going from and wanting to, to bring retail down here, I totally agree with you. I think it would be great. Okay, Councillor Yeskin. I don't know how it's going to be. Councillor Yeskin, I, don't know how Yeskin, I have seven people that. in the queue. Could you please wrap up your comments? So basically, I'm, I'm going to support the report because I still think it's going the right direction. But I see the huge struggle. I mean, your LRT is going to come, and that will help to, to some degree. Your entertainment is well, great. Restaurants are coming along, which, which is wonderful, but retail is going to be the biggest challenge as long as the grocery stores, because the suburban development from land use planning here that was approved by this council. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Thank you. So I already uh, gave some of my comments earlier. I'll just add to that to say <clears throat> that, first of all, I I want to commend the team for uh, really working on this quick turnaround timeline. It was a, an ambitious timeline, and you you succeeded. So, uh, way to go. Uh, the way I see this plan is as a three and a half year plan because the moment that it is approved, we're going to be uh, begin to uh, operationalize it. So, I'm excited to see that put into place. I also want to. Uh, comment on the fact that we do have strong partnerships, not only with the Working Centre and the, uh, the program uh, outlined today, but also with outreach workers at the St. John's Kitchen and, of course, the Waterloo Regional Police Services. So we are uh, in, in good hands in terms of uh, being able to let the experts uh, do their job best and not enter into the type of work that is not meant for a lower tier municipality. So I think that it's important to note uh, that, that uh, in order to have strong economic development, we need to acknowledge and address the issues that, that are required to be dealt with by, by uh, other uh, partners. So I also want to just, uh, uh, just address the comments about the grocery store. Yes, we do want a, uh, a large... Uh, one-stop shop grocery store and and I, I think that we we will see that uh, as as we uh, enter into an, a new phase in the downtown however we we do need to really appreciate what we already have which is the JNP grocery the new city supermarket legacy greens full circle foods the Ben Tan grocery store we are chock full of opportunities to to shop for our groceries downtown already and of course the Kitchener market every Saturday so uh, with that I am very pleased to move this recommendation Thank you. Uh, Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Davey. I just want to say uh, thank you for all the hard work because what you did is you went out and you did the research and now you developed a plan to address the issues. Uh, we know what we do well. We know what we need to work on. You've got a very workable plan. Uh, you listened and you're reacting and this will work. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grisola. Yeah. I I just want to mention, I, I moved to this community in 1964, and the downtown was very active. And I, uh, I use that as a standard as to what I would like to see it back in those days when the streets were full during the day, at night, on weekends. And in those days, we didn't have uh, patios, so people were, were shopping, were coming, were going. There was a lot of activity. 
and I'm, it's always my hope that we, we can get back to those days because things seem to be perfect. But I, I do want to draw caution. There are a number of issues. And one, one of the things that I don't want to lose sight of, and um, Councilor Ioneski has mentioned it, I represent a large area at the Fairview Mall that's been there and, and uh, Sports World. We, we can't forget those. The downtown is important, but we can't forget those locations. We have an overall problem in our society where retail stores are becoming more and more things of the past, regardless of whether it's, it's uh, in the downtown or in malls, and that's something we, we, we need to deal with. So I, I can support uh, where, where we're going. We're, we're always trying to improve. We're always trying to get, get back, I hope, to where we were with a lot of activity. It's still early. One of the problems we had was feet on the street with this transit LRT thing. I'm not sure what it's going to do for transit, but it was intended to bring people and to change our, our development in the downtowns, and, and that has happened, but yet people are still not living there. It's going to take a number of years. In the future, there should be uh, lots of feet on the street, and so that should help us with our success. I, I really do caution priority number three. To me, that has been our biggest issue for the last 20 to 25 years. It, it A lot of that occurred when the senior government changed a lot of its rules and the way it dealt with social services and, and threw, it, threw it to us. I really am not seeing a great deal of, of change from where we're going. We're, there's an awful lot of words, but I'm not sure what the action is as to what we're going to, how we're going to deal with that aspect of it. To me, that's, if there's anything that's held us back in the last 20 years, it's, it's that aspect. We have to deal with it. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, supportive of what's being recommended, I think. The success of this will be through partnerships um, as the city endeavors to partner with the BIA, uh, with our other orders of government agencies, as well as uh, working with the development community. The comments uh, that have been made already have been uh, diverse uh, in their perspective, and I don't necessarily disagree with some of the comments that uh, uh, Councillor Janetsky made that, you know, the aspect of land use planning and our suburban growth has caused some issues in our core. That point is absolutely true. And through that will be the success of our downtown through land use planning. We have to get the land use planning for our core the right way, ensuring that we are nurturing and supportive of attracting the right type of retail through policies, through allowing uh, the, uh, the densities, through development so that we have more feet on the ground, we have more residences in our core. Uh, it's not necessarily all about bringing the suburbs in our core. That should happen very organically because of vibrancy of our downtown through the placemaking, through the events that I think we endeavor very hard to do and I think we, we're continuing to succeed in that, in that effort. But what will be the, the success will be to the cre create the ecosystem here internally uh, and through that density and th I think that will be the effort forward. So if you look back the last 10, 15 years, everything that we have done, we are on a trajectory upward to improvement. So EDIF has worked well. Our efforts uh, like the, the landing pad, uh, that is uh, uh, giving us successes. Uh, the, the streetscape improvement, that has uh, brought tremendous visual appeal to our core, working with a strong partnership with the BIA. Those are the efforts that need to carry on forward. Uh, does that mean another EDIF or not EDIF? I don't know. But we, ha we can't take the foot off the pedal. We've got to accelerate it even further forward because there's a lot of potential, and we've got to make sure that we, we um, maximize as much of that. So supportive of what's being recommended. Thank you, Mayor Vibanovich. Thank you very much, Chair Davey. Uh, just very briefly, I will be supporting the, the document as well and uh, thank uh, staff again for uh, all of their hard work as well as all of the community uh, partners that provided uh, input, whether it was retailers, consumers, uh, and so on that provided uh, input into the document because ultimately uh, this is their downtown. This is our community's downtown. And, uh, you know, the reality is that at the end of the day, while our whole city is extremely important, the downtown is the foundation upon which any community, any city is, is, is built upon. 
um, and uh, we need to get it right here for, for our whole community to thrive uh, in, in every single neighborhood uh, of the city. Um, I think uh, this is a the next logical step in the evolution of the downtown. We have made significant progress uh, over the past uh, decade or so, uh, and, and we're seeing it improve uh, exponentially, in particular over the last little while. And I think um, that's really a result of a whole variety of things starting to, uh, to come together. Having said that, uh, there is more work to be done. Um, the, the one thing I would like to see, I, I mean, I will support this as it is today, but for next week, uh, with respect to um, Section 1 um, in the, or um, I guess specifically as it's referenced, um, sort of in the, just one second, Priority 1, I'd like to see some alternative wording uh, brought to council that actually specifically touches on the uh, issue of business recruitment in a more significant way because as, as has been acknowledged this has been something that uh, people have uh, have raised and talked about and so uh, I would like to see some proposed wording uh, that uh, staff from the BIA and economic development are, are comfortable with for us to consider next week. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll end my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor gallery Silak. Yeah. Um, as a councillor of the suburbs, um, I look at having the Sunrise Centre and having Williamsburg Town uh, Centre as two areas that can cohabitate close together. Uh, and that's just one smaller community within the city. And I think the diversity of having the town centre and the big box Sunrise um, work well together, and I think it can work well within a city. Um, so the point is, is if there are areas and places for people to go, they will go. And that includes the downtown. If there are things that people can come that are unique, that they can't get where they are, they're going to come. That, that includes retail, restaurants. We see plenty of people coming to our food truck events, our festivals, um, restaurants, and I think that's really important. So um, I think there is work to do on the retail side of things, but if there's, there's things that grab you and bring you downtown, I think it'll be great, and we need to continue to strive towards that. I like this strategy, and I look forward to the implementation plan, which is where the tangible asset aspects really um, come to light. And so I look forward to seeing that, because that's re really where you can um, dive into it and understand where this is going to, and how this is going to help us move us, move, move us forward in our downtown forward. So I'm very supportive. Thank you. I'll just, uh, speak briefly in terms of I, I do find it interesting that uh, how this the progress in terms of retail it starts with a, a concentrated space downtown uh, where there's limited availability and higher costs. So then we naturally progress to the malls where there's significantly larger square footage, lower land costs, so people can purchase a wider variety of products for a lower price. Now we're moving on to. The internet, where there is uh, there's an unlimited amount of virtual space and, and broader selection. Uh, so I just I want to I made my comments earlier before, but I think it's critical that when we're looking at this, we keep that in mind. And as Councillor Galloway, Sealock, and others have said, um, the only way that you can have a thriving downtown, in my perspective, going forward, is to have those um, unique experiences, unique shopping, unique service. Uh, something that Amazon can't put in a box and ship to you. If has a shelf life, you're going to be undercut. Uh, that's the reality of, of the progress that we're seeing. Um, the only other thing I wanted to touch upon is I'm going to support this. I, I do have, I did have and do have uh, concerns about the focus. Uh, this is sort of, I think this is sort of everything we'd like to do. I, from my feedback, my expectations, I would really rather see us achieve 5 or 10% of this and do it really well then try and address all of it and, and not do anything particularly well. So that, those are my expectations going forward. I don't expect success in all of these. Um, so having said that, uh, I, I don't think anyone's called for a recorded vote. Recorded vote has been called. And again, thank you, uh, Ms. Robson, Ms. Yetzi, and Mr. Bloom for your work on this.
Okay, voting is open. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, so the uh, final discussion that we have is the policy review number three. There are there is no staff presentation on this, so we'll take questions. Councillor Galloway, see left. Yeah, I just had one question on um, business and business travel and meetings. So zero thirty five. And my question is, um, it's talking about um, that council, members of council will no longer require advanced council approval to attend um, seminars or conferences regardless of location. I believe, well, I know that that's a change because it used to be um, anywhere outside of North America. I'm just questioning the change. Mr. Goldrup. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> um, it was uh, felt that um, uh, there are, are, are enough uh, reporting and controls in the in the system with respect to uh, travel, uh, and it was seen as an as an efficiency. It was, sorry. So, okay. as long as if the new would be if I was able to go to a conference in um, Geneva. <laughs> going to say Australia, <laughs> um, but I'm able to do so within the financial con constraints of my budget, I can do that now? Uh, through the chair, yes. The, the two reasons that gave rise to the change in the policy, uh, one was we uh, surveyed our uh, fellow municipal peers and uh, to see if they, if they required council approval prior to attending and they did not. Uh, at the at the regional level, uh, they do, but at the, the lower tier level, they do not. Secondly, uh, under the remuneration, the reporting for remuneration, all council travel is reported to the public. Um, so we thought with those two criteria, it made sense to be consistent with our with our uh, municipal peers. I'm a little bit concerned with that one. Um, so if we can deal with that one separately, we can. That is the second bullet point from the bottom. We'll deal with separately. Uh, Mayor Vibenovich. Thanks, and I think you touched on it, but I guess with respect to all of these, um, I guess my main thing is, have we looked at being um, sort of consistent with other municipalities in terms of, um, you know, how our policies uh, are applied? Through the chair, yes. We, we consulted. Okay, great. And on the... Um, the, the um, leaves of absence, I think that's the one where we deal with, um, with family leave. Um, so it's really there we're um, adding, the, the, the main changes are only that we're adding uh, brother and sister-in-law and, and we're letting people um, hold off on some of their days of leave because I know some families now wait till they might have a burial a few months later or a bereavement service a few months later as opposed to right away and that's what we're trying to accommodate through the chair yes okay great thank you thank you councillor fernandez yeah so on the item about hours of work and rest period related to uh, modified work programs um, can you help us understand how often we have requests for modified work programs, and if they're related to um, WSIB return to work legislation kind of stuff. Through the chair, uh, return to work and, and uh, accommodations of that kind are dealt with separately, uh, and they are medically informed and, and very precise in duration and type of accommodation. Um, modified work is available to uh, uh, full-time uh, employees working uh, 35 hours a week and uh, what it allows is uh, for them to uh, bank up to five days and, and take that time at a later time by adding a 30-minute-a-day um, increment 
to their to their work day, so they're working seven and a half instead of seven hours. So it's uh, it's really uh, it, it extends um, the uh, number of hours that uh, counters are staffed and and the work is uh, the city hall is is uh, available to uh, clients, and it also uh, allows for some flexibility and quality of life uh, balance for for employees. Okay, so you've mentioned something that that has been a bit of a concern to me, which wasn't really part of my question, but I'm, I'm glad you raised it. Okay. Um, this, this concept of the, you know, the half hour uh, over seven days, is that what did you, did you say? That, or how many days does it take to accrue that entire day off? They add uh, a half an hour um, per day uh, up, and they can, that time can be banked up to a maximum of 35 hours, and then, and then it, can't, it can't be banked beyond that. And then the employees can take it in 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 uh, blocks of time um, with approval of their supervisor. Okay, that was my next question. Who approves that? Because if it leaves uh, a department with you know uh, nobody on a Friday afternoon, especially um, during a time when building permits are requested or you know when reports come out on a Thursday and re residents start to read them and and want to to you know, ask questions about council reports or committee reports, it's, it's really important that that not, that not happen. How is that balanced? Through the chair, that is, that is the management team's responsibility to approve uh, time away and, and, and have their uh, business operations remain viable and well staffed and, and we do that. Okay, because I have, I have heard from residents in the past that they've called and there's been nobody there to respond. And, and I think that's critical, especially when um, a council report is online or committee reports are online and residents are trying to get answers and they are, they're just bumped from one um, staff person to another because nobody is able to answer the specific question. So just to raise that as an, an issue. The other question I had was also regarded the business travel and meetings, and I, and I am concerned with the, um, the gener the, sorry, the um, regardless of location. But I wanted to know what triggered the review of that policy. Has there been uh, abuses of this policy, not just from, because uh, this doesn't just talk about council, this talks about staff as well. <coughs> Through the chair, all of the uh, our policies are being reviewed as part of council direction, so co all corporate policies, and uh, we're bringing to you today a batch of the HR policies. We'll be bringing you more as we uh, as we work through them. Uh, a lot of the uh, policies don't need revision, uh, and some need uh, some administrative uh, revision, and others, as we look and consult with other municipalities and look at best practice or look at efficiencies, <coughs> pardon me, that we can attain. Um, we're, we're able to um, bring those forward in this in the course of this policy review process. Okay, I don't I don't know I know there was a comment about us being consistent with other municipalities. Why is that important? Why should we be consistent with what Kingston might offer or what Owen Sound might offer? I think it's uh, through the chair. It's a, it's a matter of uh, looking at best practice. Um, things evolve. Uh, we have uh, networks both through uh, finance and through HR of <coughs> municipal contacts that we we consult with and, and share information all the time. But why is it important that what we have in terms of uh, um, leaves of absence, rest hours, modified work programs, travel, why is it important that we should be similar to any other municipality? Shouldn't we be onto our own? Uh, what we offer our employees should be specific to our employees, our city, um, our, the, our function. Mr. Chapman? Uh, through the chair, yes, you're correct. So it's only one consideration. We look at what the law requires. We look at what uh, our current context requires. But it's always helpful to look at what others are doing because if we're an outlier, it begs a question, are we an outlier for good reason and we've got a better policy, in which case let's keep it. And if we're an outlier, it may also cause us to question, are we doing something wrong? Are we being inefficient in a process? Is there a better way to govern it? And so it's simply one factor of many that we consider. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, just have, uh, I just have one question on the modified hours uh, program. Um, just to preface, I mean, I, 
well, actually, I'll make my comment after, but uh, I notice on the, I guess, page 319, there seems to be some very specific examples. Will staff have leeway outside of the examples there? And the reason I ask is, for example, I know some in some instances it's difficult for uh, people that have daycare that starts or begins at a certain hour. So would management have the discretion to even modify that further? So if someone wanted to start at 7 in the morning or they didn't want to start until 9.30, would staff have that discretion? Uh, or is it tied specifically to this, um, like no later than 9 a.m. start, no earlier than 8 a.m. start? Through the chair, these are just examples to show how the, the, uh, some scenarios work out. But yes, uh, management has uh, discretion to, uh, to set up a, um, uh, time frames that, that are uh, within the bounds of the, the operations requirements. Uh, there is that flexibility. Very good. Okay. Um, oh, wait, sorry. One other question. On the very first one, the overtime and premium payments, uh, it's, it says that the proposed has changed, but it's not clear what it's changed from. And without getting into all that detail, I guess my only question is with that very first item, the overtime and premium payments, um, I noticed that there's no financial implications. So does that mean that this change is not expected to cost any more money? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, that's, that's fine then. Uh, do I have a mover for this? I don't think anyone's moved it yet. Moved by Councillor Fernandez, and we are going to vote on the uh, business travel and meetings uh, items separately. Uh, any comments? The second last bullet point in the recommendation, business travel and meetings. Voting on that separately. Councillor Fernandez, comment? Yep. So you know, understandably, we always need to be taking a look at our, our HR and where we are with uh, our employees and make sure that we are uh, being fair and respectful of the work that they do and, and, and the time off that that they are allowed for various reasons, whether it's uh, bereavement or illness or whatever. But I think it is important that we also know, and we've talked about this many, many times, about we are a customer service oriented industry. Residents should be able to reach a knowledgeable staff person, especially after committee reports are posted online and council agendas are posted online, if they cannot receive a reasonable response before Monday, it creates a lot of frustration. So, you know, it, it's lovely that, that uh, I mean, I don't know of any other industry that offers that kind of, you know, if you work 30 minutes longer that you can bank all those hours. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there's lots of industries that do that. Um, but I think that it's critical that we keep, we have that balance. Um, and, uh, and, you know, should I hear from another resident that they couldn't reach anybody with response, I'll be sure to let you know because it is frustrating for them. So um, I have no problems with the other changes. Thank you, Mr. Wilmer. Did you have a comment? Uh, through the chair, because this has come up a couple of times, I want to make sure that council is clear on this. The, the primary reason for the modified work hours is to make sure that our counters are available to the public for longer hours. That's the primary driver. So, for example, City Hall is open from 8.30 till 5. That would not be possible without this kind of a program. It used to be 9 to 5 or 8.30 to 4.30. So the, the driver here is to make the, the buildings available to the community for more hours. Yes, there's more flexibility for staff. And as a result of this, actually, when this was implemented, the use of sick time went down noticeably. So the flexibility has paid off for us in a couple of respects. Um, I think when it comes to the uh, accessibility, so it's different to say nobody's available than to say the right person wasn't available. And on each of our reports, there's typically an author, their director, and their department head. So there's three people. Two of those people are av available after hours by email. So I think that you know, for if for if an issue, if a, a constituent tries to contact a report's author and that person is not available, that's a reality sometimes. Uh, and it may or may not have anything to do with modified work hours. I think that the, the, each of us as a customer has options when it comes to someone in authority speaking to the content of a report. Thank you for that. Councillor Marsh? Sorry, may I ask a question of clarification? Go ahead. Just, um, so uh, looking at the uh, permission to go overseas for a conference for council members, just. Uh, if that were not, if we did not approve that change, 
what is the existing, I just want to understand, is the existing rule that uh, any council member could ask the council's permission to go overseas to a conference and, and, and still be able to go? I can see the staff from standing up there. That's, that's correct. Okay. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Chapman, do you want to comment as well? Through the chair, the only other context I would remind council of is that the old policy existed in a time when there was a combined budget for conference attendance for all of council. So there was a limit on the number you could attend, but not individual budgets. Since that time, individual budgets have been created, and so each council member has a limit within which they can spend, and for that reason, in part, we feel that this approval step is now redundant. Thank you. Mayor Verbenovich. Thank you, and I'll just uh, speak very briefly um, to this. I certainly will support uh, what's before us. On, on the modified hours program, I, I think uh, Mr. Wilmer touched on most of what I was going to say in terms of um, the fact that it actually acts as a customer service enhancer for us, and it is something that a number of other companies have. In fact, I know some of the insurance companies in town have something what they call core hours, I think, and they tend to be between I think it was, last I heard it was like 10 and 3, and everybody could sort of adjust their schedules to accommodate accordingly with, particularly if they had young children and had to, you know, accommodate for, for daycare and, um, and so on. So it is something that does exist, and as we heard, our, uh, our sick leave is going down. On the business travel piece, I think for me, quite frankly, it was the, it's the point that uh, Mr. Chapman um, just made. Um, we can't see members of council uh, going over budget anymore. Everybody has their own budget. It gets reported every year. Um, and I remember a time a number of years ago, it's probably going back a decade, when staff had to come forward because it was actually cheaper, if I remember, for a conference in the States. This was at a time when U.S. travel had to be approved for staff, and it was cheaper to actually do a conference in the States than it was to do it in Canada. And, and quite frankly, with our, all of ours being uh, reported, I think the accountabilities are there. Thank you. Councillor Ioannidis. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's always good for an organization to review all of their policies and it's it's rather important to to have best practices and to and and that way we're always updating we're figuring out what other municipalities are doing and what, what we may be doing wrong and or what we're doing something great so it's also a part of uh, keeping the morale within the organization um, high and and wanting to maybe try if our if our policies are far superior compared to other other municipalities and that's makes us a greater advantage of keeping our talent and I think that's rather important. So, um, again, we're, we're becoming a global city. Um, we compete globally. I think uh, we're no longer just looking at Ontario or, or, or North America. We're looking globally. And, um, it, and as the mayor mentioned, probably some of the costs are maybe even more or less than the case for other travels outside of North America, depending on what it is. Uh, and I'll support this because I think, I think it's, a, it's a, a way to go. And... Um, and I don't have any issues with this. Thank you. I'll support it as well. I just, uh, first of all, in the modified hours program, I think that's that, that's a great idea, and I, I'm happy to hear there's lots of flexibility in that. Uh, I can't think it's any secret that in terms of uh, compensation, I typically look for staff to be uh, middle or lower than average um, to help keep the overall staffing costs down. But that needs to comp we need to compensate that somehow to make sure that we have the best possible employees. And this is an example of how we can do that. Uh, I know I can speak personally that issues with daycare, for example, for staff, it, it can make a world of difference whether someone can start at, at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in terms of their own personal finances and makes their life that much, that much better. And again, I can, I can absolutely see that reducing the number of, um, uh, of sick calls and that sort of thing. So I'm happy to support that. Uh, in terms of the business travel, I, 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 I'll be frank, I don't plan on traveling uh, overseas anytime soon, uh, but uh, I would say that since we've uh, changed the budgeting uh, to per counselor, which pat myself on the back, I brought that forward last term, now we know exactly who is spending what amount of money and where. There is no unlimited budget, there is a very defined budget that you will have to answer to. Uh, at the end of every year. So uh, with that in mind, it's been moved by Councillor Fernandez. We are going to vote on the business travel and meeting expense first. Uh, I haven't heard a recorded vote. I think that's fine. So, okay. Okay. We have had, had for a recorded vote. So the business travel and meetings first.
voting is open. Those in favor? And opposed? Motion carries. And on the balance of the report? Recorded vote as well, yeah. Voting is open. And that carries unanimously. Councillor Fernandez. Yes. Um, on the next item of the April uh, variance report, I'd like to move that out of uh, information into discussion, please. Okay. You take a vote on that. Moved by Councillor Fernandez to take the variance report out of uh, information to discussion. Those in favor? And opposed? That carries. Councillor Fernandez. Yeah. So I have a number of questions um, on, on the variance report. Uh, just let me find my pages. Um, on page uh, IF1-8, down about halfway of the page, the um, operate, sorry, winter maintenance and roads, <clears throat> we're seeing a surplus, of course. Um, so how is this that we... The current and projected surplus due to fewer numbers of plows. I mean, I know we had a, a much uh, easier winter. Um, this, I'm assuming, will go into our reserve. Is that correct? Mr. Chapman? Uh, through the chair, no. It would only go into the reserve if overall the city was in a surplus position. But as you'll know, there's a small deficit projected. And so this would remain in the operating fund to reduce the overall deficit. Okay, so, so we'll carry it through until the end of the year, and then we'll see where we, where, where we sit. Right, and if we had a surplus, then to the extent we have a surplus, we could close out those funds to the reserve. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with regards to uh, our sanitary sewer rates, uh, sorry, that wasn't the one I wanted to ask on, our, our, our gas supply. So it's saying that due to lower commodity prices, uh, are we actually then saying that the customers are paying higher rates than we were expecting to pay? Through the chair, I think the table on page four um, explains it best. So yes, in the case of supply, we're generating a positive variance because of weather conditions, but in all other program areas of gas, we're seeing a negative variance because mm -hmm. of the weather. Uh, so arguably our delivery, transportation, and carbon rates are too low, and the supply rate is too high. Okay. And I'm so pleased to see that our golf course is <laughs> right at presently is in a, in a favorable position. That's 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 kind of nice. I think that's the first time in a long time we've seen that. Um, the other one I had was um, our water utility. So we're in a, a very favorable position right now with our water utility. Um, it does beg the question: Did we have to rate raise the rates as high as we did? Um, you know, I think I think that sitting at a seven hundred twenty-nine thousand dollar favorable variance at this point, I know we have yet to see what the summer will bring. But uh, through the chair, um, I think we're still well off the minimum for a stabilization target in that account. As you can see, it's nothing for water or sanitary to swing by a million or two dollars, two million dollars year to year. Um, so, like you, we're pleased to see a, a positive variance for once in water. But that's not been our history, and the reserve position is still very slim. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Okay, there are no further questions. Uh, that concludes Finance and Corporate.